So let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, we need hope. And this hope comes from you, Lord Jesus. It comes because, Father, you sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And Jesus, you came as the Lamb of God. You, who knew no sin, you became our sin. And you went to the cross. You paid the price and took the wrath upon yourself. And then you walked out of that grave on the third day, raising from the dead. And you defeated the power of sin and death and life. So you made us you were born again, born again, children of our loving Father God in heaven. Our name's written in the book of life for eternity. We are so thankful. And you've given us your Holy Spirit to guide and comfort us. Yes, to guide and comfort us. What a blessing. Let us live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Isn't that awesome? That's in um, Romans chapter 8. I mean, if you, you really want it, just take some time and just go somewhere you get alone and just read the 8th chapter of Romans and read it over and over and over. I mean, over and over, 20, 30 times and pray about it. And then go to the 12th chapter and read that over and over, maybe 20 or 30 times and read that. And I'm telling you, your life will change. Your life will change because you will see the power of God and how you are supposed to respond and act according to it. It talks about how you think better, how you know the will of God. It talks about the power you need. It tells you how to deal with other people, all of those things. But most importantly, it talks about living by the spirit and not by the flesh. So this passage today or this message today is about hope. We're talking about the hope process. What is the hope process? And David always reminds me, I always... I got I got all the stuff in there to go for the book, right? My book. Don't anybody steal this title now. I've been throwing it around. But without hope, what? There is no, there is no hope. And you know, um, real quickly, so let's talk about hope is thinking what? That something good's gonna happen in the future. Okay, that's hope. And dread, what's dread? Thinking something bad's gonna happen in the future, right? So what happens? What's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? I don't care whatever, but a true Christian, a Christ-focused, we're going through the narrow gate. I've committed my life to Christ. I'm going to live by the Spirit, and I'm not going to live by the flesh. What's the difference? We have hope. When there, there isn't a moment in our life where we don't have hope and we can't say, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We, there's never a moment where you don't say, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. We just... It doesn't happen, okay? Because when you have hope, you don't have dread. I mean, duh, that's really cool. Don't you think? Wasn't that a great statement, huh? Really intellectual statement? That's a spiritual statement. When you have hope, you don't have dread. Now, I personally, and Nancy and I have been talking about it, I, it's, I think it's because I'm teaching on this, and I think the Lord is sort of letting me see this, I've had some moments where some dread has just crept into my mind. I mean, some fear about, you know, this isn't going to work out, or maybe that will go wrong, or this is going to go sideways. Or, or you know, Don, you you maybe you won't make any deals anymore. Maybe you're getting old. Maybe maybe you're really in trouble. If you haven't got anything, what's going to happen to you? And Nancy and I are sitting there, and all of a sudden, we can get into a conversation full of what? Dread. And then that dread, when you just start identifying just identifying the dread, what happens? Bingo. Fear starts to creep in. Like a little dog comes over and bites you on the butt, you know? And you take that fear and you smack it away and get out of here, you know? And then you walk in there, you're minding your own business, and the thing jumps up on the table and eats your dinner. And fear is all over the place. And you've got to watch out. It's going to jump up and grab you, okay? Anybody here ever have that problem? Oh, okay, maybe none of you guys, but I do. Now, I didn't have it, to be honest with you, I hadn't even thought about it. And and that's why, you know, when I, I try to get you guys to do, I we, I pray in the morning and I've shared my prayers with you, reading the word of God every day, because I don't want that stuff to come into my life. I want to pray and feel that I'm with God, walking with God, and the power of God and his word is in me, and I'm working along, living by the spirit, not by the flesh, right? Well, then lately, um, here's what happens. People like you guys in this room and the guys that are not in the room who think they're in the room, you have to understand, I know about this. There's another hundred guys who think they're in this room. When I see them, they act as though they've been in the room. And they haven't been here for five years. And then they show up one day and it's all of a sudden like they never left, right? Except they're not in the room. And so I talk to them and they show up whenever something's really, and there's a problem, they show up. And now it's time to pray. Or their wife calls, you know what I mean? or whatever, or they die. And now we got to figure out what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this? 
or they're in the hospital. Something's really bad. So, I mean, I may be handling my own life, moving along, but because God has gotten me what? Because God said, Don, this is not all about you. This is about you being my man to go where I want you and to use whatever I give you to glorify my name and to help others. Okay? Now, the point is, and, and I some of you guys I've known forever, you understand, and Jim worked with me as my literally as my partner, my assistant. For years and years, I know, Jim, I don't know how long it was, 15 years, I forget the time, but Jim was there in every, you know, you he were the guy filtering all of these problems, remember? And I was trying to run a company and do this whole thing and at the same time run the ministry and Jim's over here like a one-armed paper hanger with all these people and all their problems and everything. He'd filter them into me and then I would go to the hospital or I'd pray for them or I'd do whatever I did. I, I didn't have time be honest with you guys, I didn't have time to be, or I didn't have time to dread, <clears throat> you know, because I, I was so involved with reading, studying, teaching, preaching, starting the minute, working the ministry. I went to Africa to do this and went to, got on the plane and went over here to Romania and did this. And when Gene and I, I remember we were both busy, but we jumped on and there we were, you know, and, and we were sitting there, Gene, all of a sudden out of nowhere, what were we doing there? You remember that translator sat between us? I was looking at the pictures to get ready for the event. I had the worst bad breath. So Gene and I are sitting between this guy, right? And we hired him as, a, as an interpreter. So when they were speaking, he would whisper in our ears like this. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. This guy, he would whisper over like this. Oh, it was so bad. Okay. And so the whole day we had this, this guy. And so, you know, long story short, that, that's a, definitely a long story. But the point is, what were we doing there? I didn't have time to be afraid and worry. Because if I let my mind go, you know where we're talking about going, right? To dread? I would have been paralyzed. I mean, paralyzed. In fact, I wasn't doing real good with my back. Remember Gene and Gene, by the grace of God, were standing in line to get on the plane to come home. And some ladies running around uh, from the thing, they used to sell everything on the, on, you know, what they couldn't just sell the seats and Gene was sitting there, and his, his back was not good either. And this lady runs by, and she says, well, we have a, a bulkhead seat, you know, and, so, you know, and then for an extra 200 whatever bucks, and Gene goes, no, I'll take that right there. <laughs> and, and he paid. And so when we came home, we got our legs, you know, stretched out, you know, so we could survive that 11-hour whatever flight. But all I'm saying to you is, look, at, I could have worried about my back. I mean, a good example is putting, playing golf. You know, you, you miss a little too. You, you, you play, you're playing lights out. You play six months, a year, two years. You're doing good. And all of a sudden, one day, and, and I was in a state amateur. One day, I had a putt. It was, I swear to you, it was no more than 12, 14 inches. I mean, it was absolutely a tap in. And I had never, I never even thought about it. I went up there and lined up, did the whole thing. And, and I missed it. And and I I, 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 I went. And what? I can't miss it. And I missed it. Now, what that did, now you know what it did to my putting? Because it ruined my entire golf game at that point on. I mean, it's a little bit of time, but it, that was the beginning. I never thought I could miss it. And all of a sudden, it put in my mind that I might miss it. And once it was in my mind that I might miss it, I had, what do you got? Red. Do you understand? I had dread. So I walked up to a three-foot putt, and it looked like a it looked like a rattlesnake. Now the odds were probably 90 at that time, probably 95%, 93% of the time, you know, it's a two and a half, three, whatever. I would make that. But there was a possibility I would miss when I needed to make it. And that snake was sitting there ready to bite me on the butt, you know. And you know what it was? It was dread. Because I did not look to the hope. When I first part, started playing golf, Mike and I used to go places. We, we, back, you couldn't get on. Remember, we didn't. You had to go somewhere and get there at 6 o'clock in the morning, sign up, and you'd sit and wait for four hours to get on the tee, right? That's the way it used to be. Remember in that place up in the mountains, we used to go up there to try to get away. And Mike and I would sit there, and we'd go out, and we'd putt. Mike and I would putt for two or three hours. And I remember putting every time I putted a 20 foot or a 30 foot or anything, I just thought I'd make it. I just tried. I just was all excited about making the putt. I never thought about what it was going to happen. You know, but I just every time. So when I went and played, all I had was this great hope 
I was going to make birdies. And, you know, and when you have that hope, you're going to make birdies. I remember making five in a row here and doing all this over here. You know, once you decide you're going to make and you want to make them, you, you boom, you do your best. And every once in a while, guess what happens? They fall in. So here's the problem. When I started to realize, and this is what happens as we get older, this is what is called a midlife crisis that people get, midlife crisis. They lose, now listen, Karen, they lose their enthusiasm and they lose their hope. Do you understand? And what happens is they realize they're not God. And, and then this is the worst part about it. They realize, you know, it may not work out. My life, my life, which I was going this way and I was doing, you know, I was taking bad hits and good, but I was getting up and I was going and this was my life. And all of a sudden, one day they realize, you know, this may not turn out well. This may go south. In their marriage, all of a sudden, this marriage, and they're going along, they're working hard, the wife's working hard, and then one day, the wife gets discouraged, and the guy gets discouraged, they happen to get discouraged on the same week, and all of a sudden, you know, this isn't going to work. You know, we just need to bail out, and all of a sudden, they lose what? They lose their hope, right? Because there's no hope. If there's no hope, there's no joy. If there's no joy, there's no, listen carefully, carefully, please listen carefully, there's no thanksgiving. And if there's no Thanksgiving in your life, you're miserable. You're miserable. And if you haven't got anything, you need to think and pray each day and think about what are you thankful for that you can look to God and say, God, my father, God, and I love you. Thank you. Thank you that I can think. Thank you that I can pray. Thank you that I can get up and go to the bathroom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why do you think Jesus told us, and, we, and we're supposed to do it, and I don't, I, I forget too. Why do you think we're supposed to pray before we eat? Why do you think? Because we're supposed to thank God for the food. Do you understand? It's not that we do that to get in heaven. It means that's what we do to keep a right perspective to who? To God, realizing that every good and perfect thing comes directly from the loving hand of God. You got that? It's in James. Everything good comes from him. Nothing good that comes into your life doesn't come from God. And that has to do with all the non-believers. That has to do with all the people that don't know Christ. Do you understand? So is there one thing, as I, I did a little uh, thing, I was talking about the political environment we're in. It's just going to be outrageous. What is the one thing that you and I need to, as, as Christians now, as men who are trusting in God, not in a political party, not in politics, and not in your money in the bank, not in the market or whatever, but what what do you what is it that you are going to project to all the people who are going to come and want to see how you react to what's going to happen? The one thing is you're not going to be, you're going to be hopeful because your hope is in Christ and you're trusting God, not the not the uh, stock market, not the interest rates. You're not going to trust in something in here. You're going to trust in God. And, and you're going to look at it and you say, it's impossible, or this is bad, or this is happening. Okay, it's impossible. All these things happen, but you have hope in Christ. And when you do that, now listen carefully, because this is the, this could be your greatest moment. Do you understand? When everything crumbles, this could be the greatest moment for you to be an evangelist. You may not have the gift. You may not remember the scriptures, but there's a moment where people are going to ask you at a specific time, they're going to say, how could you be so hopeful? How could you have an attitude like that? When everything's gone and you've been wiped out or you've been hurt or whatever, how could you be and have that attitude? And then what does Peter say? What's he say? First Peter, he says, be ready to give a reason for the hope, the hope that you have the gentleness and respect. You see, because it's going to be bad for everybody. Peter goes on to say, cast all your cares on God, because he says what? Peter said, because everybody across the world is going to suffer just like you're going to suffer, okay? And don't think you're going to, ignore. don't think you as a Christian, somehow you're going to be the Christian who skates through and doesn't have to go through the problems. So you're not going to be the one. And the more problems you have, or you can get anxiety, you can get all weird, you can go, go into the drugs, you can do all kinds of things, and you could just get so angry you can explode. It's not going to do. It won't solve any problem at all. It'll just make you miserable because you won't be what? You will not be what? Thankful. How could, and you say, how can I possibly be thankful? Everything's going wrong. And the answer is because God loves you and he's working in all those problems. And he's going to get you through it. 
Well, I don't see. How, of course you don't see. You see, you live by faith and not by sight. You see, you don't, you don't live by what you can see. You don't live by what you can figure out. You live by what God does and what God's figured out and how he wants you to be. He wants you to trust in him. Steve and I were talking about deals and business and everything. And, and to be very candid with you, <clears throat> we were just talking about things. I said, look, if you can't put the whole thing together and have some place where you're going to go and have a hope and move on to it, you can't sit around and tread water. That is, Jesus doesn't want us treading water. He wants us to move on and keep going. Every day, every day, every day is a new day. Every day you walk with Jesus. Every day you go out and do your very best. Every day you have hope. This is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad in it. For this is my portion and I'm thankful for it. Is that how you start every day? Do you pray that every day? That's right at the top of the list I gave you guys on the morning prayers. I'll bet you happy you guys don't even know where the notes are. They were there for a purpose. So today... Today, remember what it says in, uh, boy, it says right there in Hebrews, today. Today is the day you decide. We're reading that. Remember uh, Gene in the Bible study. Today is the day you decide that you're going to move forward and trust God. So last week, we went over a bunch of things. I want to read a couple things. Uh, as you know, we read um, Ephesians 6, 8, 10 through 18. And it talks about us, what? We're fighting a battle against the evil one and all the spiritual forces and the darkness that's out there, okay? Are you with me? That's what we're doing. And we need to be prepared with the truth because the truth is the belt that we, the, everything and the, and the breastplate of righteousness and the, and the shield of faith. We need all of those things, right? Okay. So let's just move forward and think about that. And then I came down and I gave you this statement. It says, do not accept the logic of darkness, of spiritual darkness. And we're, we went to that passage, we went to, Colossians 2, 8 through 10, and it says that, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and you have been, and you have fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. Now, there's a lot of stuff in there that's really important, but I want to give you something right now that you gotta, you gotta get this. You have to get this or you can't have hope. And here it is. Listen to what it says here. Who's Christ? Who is the Christ that's in you? Listen to me. Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Do you know what that means? It means that all the things that you see that are out there out of control, the evil one thinks he has control of the world, <clears throat> and he's been given a certain amount of control to mess everything up, to do because he's doing what God wants him to do, basically, through the whole process. It's all God's working through everything. Who's in control? Jesus Christ. Who do you have in you? Jesus Christ. You have unlimited power. Do you know what, what is the Holy Spirit? It's the Spirit of Christ. He's with you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. You have all the power that created the universe in you. You just have to take it and by faith put it into effect in what you're dealing with. And then what's going to happen? God's going to work his good and perfect will in your life. And when he does that, praise the Lord. And you go back to, uh, what is it? Psalm 119.71. It says, it's good for me to be afflicted, O Lord. What if I, wait a minute. How is it good for me to be afflicted? Because it will bring me to your word, the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, he's the living word. Of, he's the living word. He's the word. The living word of God. He's come. And then he goes, John chapter 6. He says, I want you to eat and drink my word. Eat and drink me. Eat and drink me every day. He says, Every day you live not by bread, but by the word of God. That's what you do. That's why you're in the room. And what, what is it that we went back, uh, Hebrews uh, 10, 22, 23, 24. And where it says, don't stop meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But meet even more so you should gather together. I was talking to JJ about this. I mean, how excited it was to see him and have you guys coming to be here. And, and we got the lunch and to bring everybody up. Why? Because God told us to. Well, nobody wants to see. Well, then you encourage them to come. Invite them. Well, gee, that's a little bit. I'm, I don't want to go out and talk to people and reach. You know, I mean, people won't like me if I ask them. People will think badly of me if I ask them to buy a business. I mean, you know, it's a Bible. You know, Jesus. I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, are you intimidated to do that? I was just reading it uh, in Luke where Jesus said, if you're not going to stand up for me, if you can't identify with me, I'm not going to identify with you when it's time to check in 
with the father. Whoops. You have a problem? Do you really have a problem that everything about you is about Jesus Christ? I mean, you have a problem with that? Do you have a problem with identifying with Jesus Christ in everything, everywhere you go, all the time? If you have a problem with that, you may not have any Jesus in you. Do you understand? And if you don't, get on the ground immediately, hit the dirt, and ask Jesus to come into your life and that you want to truly be a man of God and you want to live for him and love him and be with him and go through the narrow gate. Don't take a chance of being a goat. Don't take a chance. You want to be a sheep. And a sheep follows the shepherd. And the sheep never goes, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, he's my shepherd, but, you know, he's over here. And Who is he? Because the people need to know. Your children need it. Your wife needs to know. You know, you may have gone to, the, to church and memorized, and you know this and, you know, all that. But you don't know. Your kids got to know that you really do believe. You are really a follower of Christ. They may know all about Jesus. They may even agree about it. But they're not following Christ. And you know what Jesus says? The way you know if you're following Christ is just look at your life. Look at how you live. Look at what you do. Look at what you watch on the TV. Look at what you, comes out of your mouth. All the things that it says from a person's heart is what they, it comes out of their mouth. I remember I used to be a football coach in and, and the locker room and, and, and then out on the field. I mean, we talked and said, you know, some really... And then you come in, the guy's got the raunchy jokes, and the guy's talking the crash and the crash over here, and the guy over there. And you know, I remember when one day the Lord said, You know, you're either going to have to be with me or with them. You can't do both. And then I started saying, They started getting in the raunchy story, or the guy talked about something. I, I just said, well, I got to go. And I just started moving out of the room. I just left. I just left. And then eventually I got enough courage to say, Hey, guys. Because now listen carefully what I said, because then I was, this is, I got a little older and now I was praying for those guys. I've been praying for them because I was around them, right? So I prayed for them. That's what you're supposed to do, right? Pray for them. And then I got in the room and all of a sudden they start doing that raunchy. They do something. I said, hey, I can't, you know, I pray for you guys every day <laughs> and I can't, I can't be here while this is going on. I mean, I got to go. Now, some of the guys, it turned them towards Christ, and other guys, it infuriated them. And they hated me. And they accused me of judging them and thinking that I'm better than they are. Okay? And that's exactly what's going to happen to you. So grow up. You either are a follower of Christ, therefore you follow Christ. Did you, like, I'm sitting there, if I'm wherever I'm at, and is, is Jesus sitting right there next to me, is this where we want to be? Is this what we want to watch? You know, I'll be watching something and it comes out and something comes on. I don't. And I'll say, Lord, I don't. This is not what you want me to watch. This is not the right thing. And I, I'll just whip right through it, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it off or if I have to. And I'll say, this is not what I'm looking for. I don't need to look at that. Do I want to look at it? Yeah, of course I want to look at it. Did it look really good? Of course it looked really good. But do I want Jesus more than I want that? You see, there's a big question. That's, do I want to live by the flesh or by the spirit? And what God says, if you want hope, I'm talking real hope. And Jesus goes on to tell us this hope in a couple of minutes is the foundation, the rock you build your house on, right? So when the storms come, everything's not wiped, wiped out. In other words, it's not phony religion. It's not phony Christianity. It's not make-believe Christianity. It's truly following Christ. So think about that for a minute. Now, we got a couple minutes. I want you to look at this one with me. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 6 and 9, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety. Here it is. This is the one I was talking about. You take all of your anxiety. I love to think of it. If I got a bunch of problems, I write them on a legal pad. Boom. Write them down. Just have little bullet points of all your problems. Then I take them. I remember I used to take them like this, and I'd crumble them up in a ball. Crumble that paper up in a ball. And I'd pray this prayer, and I'd give it, and I'd throw it in a trash can. And then I'd remember that visual. Where are they? all these problems coming? Out. And then, now, those are in the trash can. I'm giving them all to Jesus. They're going to God, every one of them. And boy, sometimes I had a real list. Sometimes there was four or five, sometimes there were 12. 
and and they were impossible and they were terrible. And I got a little time for a, a quick story. And I want to read this because it really makes the difference. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift up, lift you up in due time. No, did you read underline in due time? Whoa, wait a minute. I want you to do it in my time. And God says, no, in due time. Now, what's that? That's a big trust. That's a big faith thing, right? That means you have to trust God that he knows what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And you say, but God, I, I need it now. Now. And God says, well, in due time, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Underline, because he cares for you. Now, be alert and of sober mind. That's what I was talking, as I've been talking about from the very beginning. Be alert and of the sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, here it is, the evil one, the darkness, our battle is against the darkness of this world, the demons. He prowls around like a roaring lion. That means he makes a lot of noise to try to scare everybody, do everything, looking for someone to devour. Are you going to let him devour your joy? Are you going to let him take away your hope? Because that's what he's going to do. He just wants to take away your hope. He wants you to focus on dread. If you could focus on dread, you're ineffective. Your, your light doesn't shine, and you're not going to be out there doing what? You're not going to be out there bringing anyone to Christ. You're not going to be leading your family in the right direction. You're going to be too tired, too hungover, too irritated, too angry. You're, you're not, I'm not going to church. You know, and if you do go to church, you're angry, you're mad, you're, your kids are, you know, you're just, what is it? Because you, the evil one, the evil one is out there and he's after you because you haven't taken your problems and given them to God. You're still holding them and he's taking those problems and he's using them as a lever to get you. Okay, so watch what it says here. Resist him. This is the part I've been learning over my life. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You're not alone. This is the way it is. I, again, Jesus said in uh, John 16, 33, you know, in this world, you're going to have all kinds of troubles and tribulations. Hey, but be at peace. It's okay, because I've overcome what? I've overcome the world. So he says, do not fear. What is fear? It's that dread. Okay. So you can't go there. So next one is here. He says, uh, do not, don't be discouraged. I love this one in John 16, 33. We just talked about it. You know, I told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Where's your peace? Your peace is in who? It's in Jesus Christ. Here on earth, you have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I've overcome the world. The next one is in Matthew 6, 30, uh, 31 and 33. It says, do not worry about all the stuff you need. He says, all the birds, they're out there eating and drinking. I take care of everyone. Don't you think I can take care of you? I can take care of the birds. Seriously. And next one, he says, do not love the things of the world, this world. This is uh, 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Maybe we ought to take a moment and read this. This is probably pretty important. So listen to this. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. <laughs> For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man the lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Now, what's the will of God? To trust him, to trust Jesus Christ, who was sent for you, the Son, die on a cross, raised from the dead, to trust in him, to trust that God's working in your life every day. Did you hear me? Every day, God's working in your life. He's working there for good not bad, and that you're fighting the battle. So you got to trust him every day. There we go. So what's the next? It says uh, scriptures bring in encouragement. The Romans 4, 14, 4. It says everything written. We talked about it last week. David and Goliath. We talked about what that means. In other words, everything you read in the Old Testament, all those wonderful stories and all the things, how God did this and he did that and he came through and he did all the things he was going to do. At the same time, when God was doing all that, he kept warning everybody. If you turn away from me, if you live for yourself, if you go to the world and all the idols of this world, if you follow them, you're in deep trouble. That's what God said. You're in deep trouble because the effects of all that's going to come upon you. You're going to lose the blessings of the God, of Father God. And Jesus comes and he fulfills all the needs of the law and he gives us eternal life. So now we're covered. Now, 
What happens? Now you have eternal life. What are you going to do with it? You need to go out now and spread the gospel and live your life and, and do it in a manner that God can bless. So he can bless you. So you can bless others. How do you, listen to me. I pray that you will be blessed so you can be a blessing to others. Don't you get it? Blessed so you can be a blessing to others. Not blessed so you can hoard it. Not blessed so that you can, you know, try to manipulate it over two or three or five or ten generations. You want it, you want the money, you want everything you have to be go out and to create a harvest so that your children can be part of the harvest and your grandchildren. It's all about Jesus Christ. I say that, and in my heart, it just touches me. I just think about when Paul said in Colossians 1.27, he says, the mystery of all that's happening, the mystery of the Old Testament and all that took place from Genesis to, to Malachi, everything about the Old Testament comes together. All the scriptures come to one mystery, the mystery, the mystery, and here it is. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So in other words, everything is about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because when now what is what are the words? Let's take them apart and we got two minutes. Hope of glory. Hope of glory. That means hope to be with Jesus in his glory and to be one with him in heaven. We talked about that. To go. What is it? You walk from this world. I got called. I, I got a call yesterday. Quick, quick stuff. Somebody calls me and their teenage daughter wanted to know, really important, if someone commits suicide and they're a Christian, do they go to heaven? And I said, well, there are certain religions that you and I both know that say that if somebody commits suicide, they don't go to heaven, okay? But then you have people who realize that if you know Christ and you truly know Christ, that means that you have trusted him for everything. It's highly unlikely that you would ever have any inkling of killing yourself ever. Because you want to glorify the Lord. <clears throat> so that's number one. Number two, there are things that happen to people's mind. They they have, you don't know it. There's all kinds of things that go in their mind. And they, they go mentally. They, they, they don't think correctly. They start to look at things. And they be, oh, become overcome with what? Overcome with? Dread. They don't see a future. They don't see a hope. So ladies and gentlemen, what happens to somebody when they commit suicide? They lose their hope. Without hope, there is no hope. So I said to them, I said, you know, number one, you don't know and I don't know because the Bible does not tell us, the Bible does not tell us that those people go to hell. But what we do know is that someone trusts in Christ and Christ alone, that that person's going to be with Jesus the moment they leave this world. And you and I have no idea what's going on in somebody's body and their mind that would bring them to that point. Do you understand? So for us to judge that person, remember James says, do not judge. I think what he's talking about, you and I have to judge people all the time. But I think what God's talking about is you and I cannot judge somebody's salvation. I can't judge you and you can't judge me. I can look at the fruit and I can get an idea, but you can fake it. You look in there and Jesus talks about how the people fake it and they do all the stuff. They do all the Christian stuff, but they're not. He doesn't know them. OK, do you know Jesus? Is he your Lord? Are you the sheep of his? Are you one of his sheep? I mean, do you know that you're one of the sheep and you want to know where you know it? Now, listen carefully in John in Romans eight. Again, it talks in there about his spirit and your spirit will come together and you will be given the assurance of your salvation. You want that? Now, once you have that assurance, you have, ladies and gentlemen, what do we have? You know, we have hope. When you have that assurance, and even if you go through some kind of a mental mess, I don't know, the, the brain starts working wrong, you have some kind of brain damage, you, I don't know what it is. You can just have some kind of an internal thing going on that I don't know about. And it forces you and moves you into that place. And so I don't know the answer. I said, I don't know for sure because it doesn't say for sure, but I know that if you trust God, I know that if you know him and it's Christ in you, you're going to be in heaven. You're going to go from life to life because he's the resurrection and the life. And you don't die. You go to life. Now, here's the point. This whole message is about hope. And I'm looking at all you guys and every one of you has a totally different situation. I mean, there are a lot of like, but you've got different deals. Okay. 
everybody here. You got businesses, you got jobs, you don't have a job, you don't have a business. You got uh, somebody who's dying in your family, somebody's not dying in your family. You got kids that are going south, you get kids that are not going south. You got all this stuff going on. It's all different. But if you're in Christ, living by the Spirit, eating and drinking the Word of God, and look at this, this is a great group today. What if 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 you're here? What Jesus says, if you're gathered together, and I love this when he said this, and even the more so as you see the day approaching. Is the day not approaching, guys? Turn on your television. Take a moment to read the paper. It's all going south, all around you. So what are you going to do? You're going to trust Christ, and people are going to look at you and say, how could you do that? How come you... And you just keep working. It seems like you're doing well. How, how do you keep going and all these problems and all the things? Because I trust Christ. I know. I truly, the word of God gives me the hope that I have that I can move forward no matter what happens. And then the wind's blowing and the house is shaking and you, you're standing on the rock. You're on the rock. Nothing's going to take you off that rock. We need to tell people about that, guys. And you need to tell your kids about that. You need to tell your and when you tell your kids, you got to make sure you're not slipping off the rock yourself. You know, that doesn't hold a lot of credibility. And so what we need to do now is pray that we'd have hope. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I need hope. These guys need hope. Thank you. They're, they're here. Thank you. The most important hope we have is that we know, Jesus, you came and died on the cross for our sins and paid the price. You rose from the dead and walked out of that grave on the third day. You made us yours born again children of our loving, living Father God in heaven. We are so thankful, and you've given us your Holy Spirit to guide and comfort us. Lord, guide us today, comfort us today. Let our hope be in you, Jesus, in everything we do, say or think. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God.